my microphone on mute as much as possible, but hello and welcome to Mind the Gap episode two. My name is Steve Palmer. I'm the Industry and Innovation Lead for the Randwick Health and Innovation Precinct. Um, Mind the Gap is a quarterly seminar series which is designed to unpack what's involved in collaborative innovation and how best to get new ideas and health technologies through the market for the benefit of patients and clinicians. And it's brought to you by the Randwick Health and Innovation Precinct team. Um, in episode one, we looked at some theoretical considerations around what's involved in innovation with a case study on the development of an ICU tower with Dr. Miles Park. That's on YouTube. You can go and look it up if you want to, if you missed that one. Um, today, we're looking at the practical side of innovating with, with an institution, with the institution that employs you and what we mean by technology transfer. And for that discussion, we, we're very privileged to have Dr. Joy Francisco, who's the Senior Business Development Manager for Life Sciences at the UNSW Tech Transfer Office, which is called Knowledge Exchange. And she'll be presenting a talk entitled, we have to be very careful I pronounce this, what the <laughs> FAQ is technology transfer. And then following that, we've got a fascinating case study presentation from Professor Bill Walsh, who's the Director of Surgical and Orthopaedic Research Laboratories at UNSW. He has this laboratory located in the Prince of Wales Hospital. And there's a rather nice additional connection that Joy is actually one of Bill's former PhD students, so they've known each other for a very long time. Um, Bill's going to make it real for us by telling us about his innovation journey through the years in a talk entitled Success and Failure, Two Sides of the Same Coin. Now, during the talks, uh, can I encourage everyone to keep your microphones on mute to minimize any background noise? Um, we're going to keep the questions for the panel until the very end. So we'll leave 10 minutes for that approximately. Feel free to type questions into the chat as they occur to you. That's fine. And I'll read them out at the end. Or if you'd like to ask a question verbally during the last 10 minutes, just raise your electronic hand and I'll invite you to ask it. So without further ado, we'll kick off and I'll invite Joy to tell us what the FAQ technology transfer is. Over to you, Joy. Awesome, thanks, Steve. I'll just um, share share the slides. Okay, great. Um, so thanks, Steve, for the intro and the invitation to present. Um, you know, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about a topic that I'm so passionate about. It's become ingrained as part of my identity, um, and that's the wonderful world of technology transfer. So I've been in the tech transfer business for over 10 years, working on hundreds of cases with researchers, clinicians and students. Um, so when I was asked to speak at this seminar, I thought the most useful way would be to go through these most frequently asked questions that I get. So first up, what is tech transfer? So tech transfer, also known as research commercialization, is essentially about partnering with industry or establishing new businesses to commercialize IP or technologies developed in research organizations so that um, they can become products and services that benefit society. At its core, it's really about taking an idea to market resulting in impact. So why is tech transfer important? It's important because the cost to get a product to market is significant, and even more so for life sciences sectors in terms of time and cost, um, as illustrated in the top image. The bottom image illustrates how the value of the opportunity increases um, with the ad uh, advancing stage of development. So research organizations are excellent for new ideas and establishing proof of concept. However, making and selling products isn't their core business, and so it's critical to partner with an existing company or establish new ones to be able to access the funding, infrastructure, and expertise to get through this, um, this inflection point and drive the activities to get a product or service to market. Now, the role of a tech transfer office is to work with researchers to support getting a project or technology as close as possible to that inflection point so that it satisfies the business case for a company to want to license it or for an investor to want to invest in creating a startup to commercialize it. Um, for each project, what this inflection point looks like, you know, for example, what experiments or results that form a data package um, would be. So that may vary um, depending on, you know, for example, the sector or the indication, the end use. Um, and so this is something that the tech transfer office can help um, point you in the right direction for what those milestones might look like, as well as um, mapping out the IP protection strategy and timing of when patent applications should be filed. 
Um, one point I want to make here is that um, the primary driver for tech transfer or research commercialization is actually for impact rather than financial returns. So the financial returns are a byproduct of tech transfer and the desire to make an impact, not the driving force for it. For most research organizations, commercialization income is much less than 5% of its um, research expenditure. And in part, the percentage is low because research organizations operate on the very early stage of the journey where the relative value is low because the risks at that point are relatively high. Not all opportunities make it. In fact, many will fail. But the idea is that the more tech transfer activity, the more learnings and opportunities there are that could be progressed. And so the higher the chances that something will make it to market and have an impact. All right, so who does tech transfer? In most research organizations and even some hospitals around the world, um, they have a tech transfer office that carry out this function. Now, the name of the office might vary across the different institutions. It could be called tech transfer, knowledge transfer, business development, innovation, commercialization, or licensing offices, but they all typically have the capacity to support the tech transfer process, which I'll discuss um, a little later in my talk. The tech transfer office is staffed with tech transfer professionals like me. Um, we effectively serve as a bridge between research and industry to catalyze um, translation and impact through that tech transfer process. And so for us um, to be able to serve in this function, tech transfer staff uh, typically have a combination of qualifications and experience in science, business and law. With broad experience comes broad networks. And so this is handy because tech transfer staff often have to cover a wide range of um, opportunities and sectors. In my case, it's life sciences, which encompasses drug development, therapeutics, med tech and health tech, digital health and so on. Um, and it's very difficult to be an expert in everything all the time. And so having those interdisciplinary and industry relationships mean we have people we can reach out to when needed to work with or point us in the right direction. So how does IP fit into tech transfer? So working in research requires great intellectual efforts. So naturally the outputs of research tend to be products of the mind. Um, which I've broadly placed into these three categories. So it could be deep expertise and capabilities, which may be technical, clinical, or you know, other kinds of expertise. Um, you've got information, um, for example, data that could come from preclinical and clinical experiments. Um, this has importance in establishing a data package for IP protection, as well as supporting regulatory approval, um, particularly for sort of medical products. Um, and unique data sets are also becoming very important for digital health business models. The third category I've got is IP. Um, patents and software copyrights tend to be the most relevant for a research organization. And of these three, IP tends to be the most important for industry um, grant funders and investors. Um, for copyrights and patents, they're registrable and protectable rights by law gives exclusivity in use and keeps others from practicing the invention. So, you know, therefore it um, you can um, um, it has a higher value in terms of deriving commercial competitive advantage. Um, and so this is why there tends to be a lot of focus on having a commercially relevant IP position um, as that's an important requirement for establishing industry partnerships and securing funding. So probably one of the biggest questions is who owns the IP. So in research organizations, um, typically the employer owns the IP developed in the course of a staff member's employment. Now, should that IP be commercialized by the employer? Um, so for example, the employer licenses the IP and gets royalties in return. Uh, the contributing staff member will get a portion of the net commercialization revenue received by the employer. So the exact sharing proportions may vary between um, across the different organizations, um, but the idea is that um, a portion goes to the creators of the IP in recognition of the contribution um, and a portion is retained by the organization to continue to support research efforts. And so the best way to know more is to ask for a copy of your organization's IP policy and reach out to your tech transfer contact to have a discussion. 
Um, one question that comes up a lot in clinical fields is the situation where, for example, somebody has both a clinical appointment at a hospital and an academic appointment at a university. In this instance, IP ownership may not be as straightforward as it may depend on certain conditions like under what capacity someone performed the work to develop the IP or what resources or sources of funding they use to do that. Um, what typically happens here is that the person will reach out to one or both of their um, tech transfer contacts to discuss the case and then the tech transfer contacts discuss with each other to develop a path forward. In some cases, it, it may turn out that um, both employers are co-owners. So in this case, they get together and decide which one is better placed to lead commercialization efforts and how they'll share the patent costs and commercialization revenue. In Australia, each co-owner of the IP can commercialize the invention for themselves, but they can't license um, the IP to others without the permission of the other co-owner. So as research institutions typically don't make and sell products themselves and rely on licensing the IP to companies to do that, it's really important that the co-owners agree on who will lead because there's no way a company is going to want to have to negotiate with two different institutions to access the same IP. Like that just ends up in the too hard basket. Um, as each organization has its own policy for apportioning commercialization revenue it receives with their inventors, the inventor may receive a share from both of its employers through their employers' respective mechanisms. Um, but like I said, it's best to talk to your um, tech transfer office for advice, as it really depends on the specifics of your particular case and the employer's IP policies. Um, now, in the case of universities where research students are enrolled, typically students have ownership rights to IP they create in the course of their studies. So if they're the sole creators, then it's fairly clear. However, if a student co-invents with a staff member, then you know both the university by virtue of the staff member and the student have co-ownership rights to the IP. In this instance, the student may decide to assign their interest to the university, and in exchange for doing that, they'll benefit um, in the same way as a staff member, where then they become eligible to receive a portion of the commercialization income that the university receives. Um, again, these things tend to be case specific and your tech transfer office um, can advise you further. So the reason IP ownership is so important um, is because it legally determines who has the right to commercialize or give others like a company the permission to commercialize IP. So in the past, there have been instances where um, a researcher may not have been aware of their institutions IP policy and attempted to commercialize it themselves without working with their tech transfer office. Um, what routinely happens is that a company or investor will want confirmation of who the IP owner is because from their perspective they're about to invest like a lot of money and resources on it and so they just want to make sure that the IP ownership is clean before moving forward. Um, and this is because the, if, you know, if the company signs the deal with a researcher, right, and it turns out that the institution is the owner, then the company doesn't actually have the legal right to commercialize it. So it, because they don't have permission from the owner. And so it's a lot of time, um, effort and money wasted, as well as potentially damaging to the company and, you know, the individual researchers reputations. And so these issues are in everyone's best interest to avoid. And so best to talk to your um, tech transfer office for guidance on the IP policy and navigating the next steps. Okay, so what is the tech transfer process? Um, so this is the tech transfer process or life cycle. It starts with research that gives rise to an invention that may have commercial potential. At that point, the researcher would then submit an invention disclosure form to the tech transfer office. So the information collected in the form includes um, a description of the invention, how it works, who contributed to its development, what resources and funding was used, what commercial applications could it be useful for, what developments have been done to date, and what developments are planned. This information is important for transfer staff to complete the evaluation of the opportunity. So evaluation involves looking at the technical feasibility, commercial and market opportunity, 
IP position. Um, so IP type as well as um, I, the scope of um, the IP in the case of patentable IP. And it also, um, evaluation also involves looking at legal ownership and any third party obligations. So for example, if there was a research contract that funded the development of the IP, there may be IP terms there that dictate how the IP is to be managed. Now, if the opportunity is commercially promising, um, an IP and commercialization strategy is developed. So you can see that much of the groundwork happens here in the evaluation stage. And so this is why it takes a lot of time and does require the tech transfer staff to be working closely with the researchers and, inve um, and inventors to develop the plan together. So from there, um, IP protection is then carried out. Uh, for a non-patentable IP such as software, it's already protected by copyright or by maintaining aspects of the code and algorithms confidential. So there's little cost involved in protection, relatively. Um, for patentable IP, to get from filing a patent application to a granted patent takes many years and is very costly. So the initial filing alone um, can be at about five to twenty thousand um, dollars, and then because you have to file and prosecute a patent application in individual countries, the costs easily ramp up to hundreds of thousands within two and a half years, and then you have each back and forth with the patent examiner in each country means even more fees. Um, and then if the patent is granted, there are patent maintenance fees um, that will need to be paid at certain intervals. And so this is why the um, evaluation phase is so important because it allows an understanding of the IP position for the invention and the cost benefit for whether to seek patent protection. Essentially IP, particularly patents, are there to incentivize commercial development by a company because like I said earlier, it excludes others from practicing the invention. So the invention should be something with high commercial potential or industry demand to make seeking patent protection worth it. So what are the pathways for commercializing IP? So there's two common pathways. Um, the first um, is licensing IP to an established business. And the second is you know, using IP to create a new company as a vehicle for establishing a new business. In the licensing pathway, a license agreement is done to give an established or revenue generating company the commercialization rights to the IP. And in exchange, the institution gets a royalty stream, which is reinvested into research and rewards inventors, um, as well as often a research contract is also done um, to be able to provide assistance with ongoing developments. In the startup pathway, a license agreement is still done to give the startup commercialization rights to the IP, um, but often this is in exchange for equity. Because it's a new business, don't have revenue, and the licensed IP is the foundation for the business. And a contract research is also, uh, often also done to provide assistance for ongoing developments. Funding here is typically from investors who also take equity in exchange for that funding. Multiple fundraising rounds are needed to develop the company and fund activities to get products and services to market. Um, there are a variety of resources and accelerator programs that provide early startup funding and advice that the tech transfer office staff can um, connect you with. So how do we benefit from tech transfer? So it all starts with the creation of IP with commercial potential in an area of unmet need, which means it's a high quality invention disclosure. This will attract industry partnerships and commercial investment through licensing, spin outs and research contracts. Um, and that helps you establish your um, record of industry collaboration. Um, and the critical benefit of this is that it enables knowledge exchange between researchers and industry um, and you have a better understanding of each other's needs and how best to work with each other. Um, and so through that, it means that you're also more likely to then create more high quality IP and invention disclosures in the future. Because of that knowledge exchange and relationships, you're more likely to have highly translatable projects, 
which means higher quality grant applications, so more chances of funding success, as well as having commercialization income to reinvest into research. And so what it what this is doing is um, essentially diversifying your research funding streams. So it means you're, you're able to secure a more sustainable funding for your lab, research endeavors, and the cause you're championing. Having the IP you developed or research you undertook, um, you know, lead to products and services, that's demonstrable evidence of your research translation skills and adds credibility to your track record. And so then the, the cycle can begin again. So, you know, it's essentially, um, it's a research translation engine. And so the more cycles of this that happen, um, the more impact your work has. And these are just some examples of um, impact, whether it be, you know, for society, health outcomes and value-based care in terms of, you know, health innovations, um, economic development, talent pool, reputation, um, and so on. So these infographics just illustrate the benefit of tech transfer in Australia and measures of impact. I've included these here to give you a more real sense for tech transfer activity um, in Australia, where the left infographic shows data from the last five years and the one on the right shows data from 2021. This information is from a report commissioned by KCA, which is Australia's industry body for tech transfer professionals. Each country or region around the world have their own tech transfer bodies as well. Um, so if you want to read the report, I've provided a link in the um, bottom right hand corner. So last question, how do I engage with tech transfer staff? The so first tip is, is best, it's, it's best to engage early as this helps with preparation and execution. So this table has examples of the typical types of assistance um, you may seek, when might be good to contact tech transfer staff and how they can help. For advice on IP protection and commercial path, it's a good idea to talk to your tech transfer staff once your team have some interesting results that could have commercial potential before you disclose to others. This is important for patentable inventions because novelty is a required criteria to get a patent. And in most countries, um, an invention that has been publicly disclosed is considered as not being novel. And so you're not gonna be able to patent it. Also preparing a patent application takes time and often some back and forth with the patent attorney. And so you'll wanna engage with the tech transfer staff early, um, you know, rather than perhaps the day before the work is being presented at a conference or when the paper is about to publish. Um, it can it is quite a stressful experience for all involved. So best to avoid being in that position if possible. Um, another example for why you should engage early is um, in the case of potential industry collaboration or collaborative grant applications. Um, so I had a case where an industry partner and a researcher put in a linkage grant application um, and we hadn't been made aware of it until it was awarded and an agreement needed to be signed to release the funds for the project. As it turns out, there were fundamental differences in views on the IP arrangements between the company and the university to the point where both parties decided to amicably walk, walk away. One of the comments from the company was that they'd wish they'd discussed options on IP arrangements with the tech transfer staff as they were scoping the project, so even before the application went in. And that way, you know, both sides knew what to expect and a decision could have been made earlier and it just would have saved everyone, you know, a lot of um, trouble and you know, mismatched expectations. In the end, um, we were fortunate to be able to find another company and change the project so we could still use the funds. Um, and finding partners is another reason for engaging tech transfer staff early um, because time is needed to develop the right approach and it's very difficult to get commitments from a company at short notice like you know two weeks before a grant application is due you know it's probably not going to happen which brings me to the second tip um, and that's to encourage 
um, regular engagement and ideally at various levels in the organization. Um, and the, the idea is that um, tech transfer becomes, you know, integrated with research activity so that um, tech transfer staff are better able to anticipate what support you might need. And so hopefully, you know, this leads to a more proactive rather than reactive um, engagements. And that's all um, I think we've got time for today. As you can see, I really like this image because collaboration with a variety of people is the key for successful technology transfer and impact. So thanks so much for your attention. Um, I hope that was helpful. And if you're interested in learning more, um, don't hesitate to reach out to your tech transfer contact. Joy, sure, thanks so much. That was really helpful. Sorry, forgive me. Sir. Really great this uh, right insights. Yep. Can you hear me okay? <clears throat> yep, yep. Um, so yeah, I think I recall that particular ARC linkage project, Joy. So um, yes, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'd be familiar with that one, Steve. No, I am familiar <laughs> with that one, yeah. So as I say, um, leave your questions for Joy until the end or pop them in the chat right now. We're gonna, now going to move on to our second panelist, our case study, Bill Walsh. Um, Bill, delight, delighted to have you today to give your presentation entitled Success and Failure, Two Sides of the Same Coin. I think you're on mute, Bill. I was just saying what a great job Joy did. So now I have to repeat all of those all those kind comments. No, I mean, I've known Joy for many years and um, having someone that you know and trust in your tech transfer office is extremely important. Um, also someone you have confidence in. Um, and so what I wanna share with everyone today is some of my experiences with respect to collaborating with industry, uh, commercializing, um, and really it's a true collaboration. get myself sorted here. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge um, Matt Pelletier, one of my senior staff and my team at SORL, uh, as well as my colleagues and support from the, um, the hierarchy of UNSW and Knowledge Exchange, which is our tech transfer office at UNSW. When we think about um, developing intellectual property or doing research, uh, regardless of whatever the topic, it's collaboration. And collaboration is a big word, and it can either be active or passive. Um, I think working together um, in a team is the way to go. Um, but when you work together to achieve a common goal, you really can um, go beyond just reporting uh, a journal paper or reporting what your scientific outcome is. Um, really, it's a true collaboration, and it could be both from an academic point of view with students or colleagues um, at your institution or multi-institutional, and it also can be with industry. Um, I've had the great opportunity to work with a number of startup companies around the world over the past 30 odd years during my time at UNSW. Some of them are large multinational companies, some of them are startups, um, and it really depends on what part of the journey they're on. Um, and, you know, I was reflecting this to um, to Steve and to Joy, is that when you surround yourself with people that are interested in commercialization and intellectual property, you kind of get the bug, you kind of learn the tricks, you learn how to do it and how not to do it. Um, and so over the past uh, 30 years, I've learned how not to do it for a number of times and how to do it. And hopefully what I'll share with you today will um, provide you with some insight. Um, ideas and research, inventions, IP industry, they're all, they all stem from that in, uh, initial idea that either you as a scientist or a clinician slash scientist you have. And commercialization of your ideas is an entirely different process. Um, it's something that I was never trained on how to do. Um, I've kind of learned it through the school of hard knocks, um, but I've had a lot of people along the way um, that have helped me through this pathway. And it is really powered by um, empowering the people within your institution that are there to help you. Um, I think ultimately um, there's a lot of things that we know and when we know things, we're very familiar with them. Um, when we don't know things, we are a little bit worried about them and it's often the things that we don't know that we don't even know. And this, you know, Donald Rumsfeld, who is, you know, a US politician talked about the known knowns and the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. When you get down to not even knowing what the questions are, 
that industry will bring to you about commercialization, intellectual property, royalty stream, uh, royalty streams, licensing, patenting, contracts, all of those things. That's when you really need to bring in the experts and get their advice. Um, and I was listening to the results of the recent rugby league when Australia uh, beat Samoa. And one of the comments from one of the um, sportscasters was, this is a group of highly qualified experts. They're all great rugby league players, but unless they come together for as a team, they're never going to get over the line. Um, and I think when you come together as a team, um, utilizing all that you have at your disposal, that's when you can be successful. Um, and if you listen um, to CEOs of companies, and I um, ironically, I listened to one yesterday while I was driving uh, from a small company that was just re recently sold um, to ConMed for 250 million. He surrounded himself with experts um, to achieve his goal. I actually did all their preclinical studies, so I kind of learned a lot during their journey as well. Um, so commercialization of an idea, well, it's not always starting a company, but it could be. Um, and if you're gonna start a company or not start a company uh, or just license your IP, um, you really need to understand what is an exit and uh, do, you even, um, do you even know what an exit is? And if you do exit, will you be happy with it or will the exit potentially ruin your life? Um, there's lots of great literature out there on commercialization that are in the business world. Um, some of it is starting to overlap into the scientific world. Um, this is a paper that I, that I found that I uh, thought was interesting um, that was published about 10 years ago. And it talks about the simple rules of commercialization of scientific research. And one of the things that's very aware, and this is probably motherhood statements for many of you, is that what drives science does not drive business. Science is driven by the advancement of knowledge, understanding things, and if for those of you who work in the healthcare sector, we ultimately want to improve patient outcome. Um, but in the business world, it's driven by money. Um, so those two are uh, competing interests. Um, there are also many different pathways to a successful endpoint. Um, and before you hand over the keys of your idea, um, as Joyce said, you really have to make sure, A, do you do you have it? Do you own it? Can you actually commercialize it? And is it um, is it something that is novel, inventive? Does it move the needle? Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a patent for it to be commercialized, although a patent is seen in the commercial world as a competitive advantage, but it's not the only pathway. Um, so now we can really begin. I'll show you some examples. So commercialization ideally is bringing new products to market. Um, and if you think of a new product, it has to go through development, production, the regulatory approval, then it has to be adopted by the clinicians, be it surgeons or other medical um, subspecialties. Then it has to be sold. It has to be supported. You have to get registration. You have to get reimbursement. Many of these things for your typical academic, you leave, you leave it at development. All of these other aspects are things that, that we have really no, no um, foundation in. Um, let alone the registration and reimbursement side. I've been lucky in my um, 30 plus years at UNSW, I have participated um, in preclinical development of probably 200 products and have done over 150 510K applications to the FDA. Um, but that's only the FDA or the regulatory side. It doesn't even include the reimbursement side, um, the, the healthcare economic side where insurance companies have to also come into play uh, and let alone getting it adopted by the hospital new technology committees. Um, not always, everything that you do doesn't always hit the bullseye. Um, and I think it's important to realize, and it's multiple, multiple shots at the board that you can start uh, creating, um, I guess, a track record. Um, and then ultimately you get to a point where you can make people an offer that they can't refuse, where you have good preclinical data, good scientific data, firm understanding of IP, good support from your tech transfer office, and then you have really a good setup. Um, so intellectual property, what is it? How do I get it? What does patents mean? Joy did cover that slightly, um, but it's far more um, detailed than that. I don't claim to be an expert in intellectual property, but there are always the good and the bad and, and the ugly. You always have to give Clint Eastwood a shout out. Um, I'm lucky. Um, uh, we have a strong office at UNSW that uh, is our text transfer. Um, I know everyone quite well from Dax and Joy to Naomi and to Des. Um, but we also work quite closely with some very, very good patent attorneys in Australia um, from F.B. Rice, Rachel Hook, and from Griffith, Ka uh, Griffith Hack, Georgina Higginbotham. These two people are fantastic. They 
meet with you after we've um, done that initial disclosure through the university, which is what you're supposed to do, and it's a good thing to do it early, then you'll know really if you have an idea and if it's patentable. And then working with pe people like uh, Rachel and Georgina, they help you hone your idea down, really focus on the intellectual property side. And patents are a massive topic, um, which is probably the source of many, many other seminars. Uh, and they're more complex than most, I guess, most academics would even really um, bear to understand. And it really starts with that initial disclosure to your institution. Um, and then you go through ste steps of a provisional filing, which only costs a couple thousand dollars. And then you go to PCTs and further filing. Um, but then the ultimately the patent gets reviewed for inventive steps and novelty. This is pretty much like a journal paper where or a grant that gets reviewed. Does is it a new idea? Have you broken new ground? What's inventive? What's not inventive? But then there's um, the old series or the old, um, I guess the bugbear for inventions is, is there prior art out there? Has it been disclosed publicly? Has someone else disclosed an idea that's similar? Even if it's not a patent, if it's been disclosed publicly, if a company has a piece of gear out there that they have patented, but it's out there, um, prior art is there, so therefore um, novelty is not there. You can also have method patents, which are a little bit weaker. And then you can have things like A1 patents, which are provisionals, uh, B1 and B2, which are granted patents. Uh, B1 is something that doesn't get published before it gets patented. Um, that often has a little bit more commercial, um, uh, I guess a little bit of more commercial edge because a, a commercial sponsor would not want a patent to be published before they're ready to launch a product to give, um, I guess, to potentially give it gain a commercial advantage. And then a B2 patent is more traditional. And then you have things called divisional patents where you can uh, patent further from what you come up with. Um, and so my advice again is to talk to the tech transfer at the beginning rather than at the end. Otherwise, you'll, it could end in tears. Um, are there rules? Are there? Is there an instruction booklet? Some people would say there is. I would say there's not. I would say that there's many different ways to commercialization. Um, I've tried a few. Um, some have been successful um, on one end and some have been successful on another end. It just depends on what you grade success at. And I think Joy, Joy's point was really important. It's not about it's not about a financial return. It's about the overall branding of the institution. It's about the the um, the the impact of your research to improve outcomes. Um, and you know, everyone said, oh, I wrote it on a na on a napkin and I did it on a little piece of paper. Um, in some countries now, it's not the first to invent, it's the first to file. I think that changed a few years ago for the United States. Um, but you do have those aha moments. And if you have them in the research lab, um, it's really, it's an amazing buzz and it's great to, to do those kind of things. I'll show you a few things that I did. This is um this is a uh, some work I did with Damian Marucci, who was a he was a general surgeon who switched to plastics, did a PhD with me, and uh, we came up with an idea with John Cartmill, who's also a general surgeon in Sydney, and it was a laparoscopic grasper slash distractor. It went all the way to a full patent. We met with multiple industry partners. Um, that patent has been cited um, almost 600 times, so it has an impact. So it's been cited in the peer-reviewed literature. It's also been cited in the patent literature, but we never commercialized it. And it was a great idea, but it was at the wrong time in the commercial pathway. And by the wrong time in the commercial pathway, when we tried to license this to US Surgical and to Johnson & Johnson, they had just come out with all their new laparoscopic graspers. They had tooled up for everything. And whilst they recognized that our technology or our idea was superior because it was a parallel mechanism, um, it was the wrong time in their pathway. Um, and so whilst granted impact, never commercialized. Um, and so that's a patent that you know, we came up with that idea you know, 20 years ago. Um, I've come up with a lot of ideas, gone to full patent on many of them. Um, some of them are at different stages of commercialization. Um, some of them have basically just um, died um, because we couldn't find anyone to partner with. Um, so again, it's not always a successful pathway. Um, here's another one. This is another one. Um, there's another one. Um, here's another one that I'm in the midst of commercializing at the moment. So it's not 100% strike rate. So you do have successes and you have failures. Um, but I'll give you a few examples. What I, had, what I can tell you is that for every experience that I've had, I've learned tons along the way. Um, it's been a lot of hard work, but I've had a lot of fun. 
and I've tried a few different pathways and I'm still learning on how to do it. So the good news is that I still want to learn. Um, this is one that um, I did with my, um, he was my master, he was my uh, medical student who did his honors with me, then he did a master's with me, and then he did a PhD with me. His name is Graham Matheson, and he had um, an idea that we explored and we basically developed a way to extract chemicals from plants that are grown on the Cook Islands. Um, Graham actually formed a company with the Cook Islands and with UNSW, and we were able to patent um, a method of extracting um, uh, inductive molecules from plants. And uh, these did have a biological effect, um, but we pivoted um, or the company pivoted after they raised some money to make a skincare product. And whilst it was a lot of fun, it would never was commercially successful. And I went to the Cook Islands a few times and surfed with Graham a few times in very dangerous waves. But um, it never was commercially successful because that landscape is extremely competitive. And so that was something that I didn't have a big role in the commercialization side. I was more the academic guy sitting in the background. That has been rebranded to Tavadi, which is again a similar um, product, and it's uh, currently still in kind of commercialization stages. So success on one hand, I'm still friends with Graham. We meet all the time uh, and we're still trying to do things. Um, this is another one that I did with my colleague Matt Pelletier, um, and this was a one on spinal fusion. Um, and we basically identified an idea of actually fusing the spine is like building a bridge. Uh, and until you have a complete bridge, you have nothing. And so we came up with an idea that if you could actually fuse um, with a device, you could actually achieve spinal fusion. We've got a number of patents. Um, we have an MDF grant that we're running. We raised probably total about $4 million and we're in the midst of a first in man. This is one where we decided to do a little bit more product development ourselves. And we went through, we did lots of product development locally. Um, we're now 3D printing the implants. We did all the testing under a, a um, with an outside agency to do everything under design control and design history files. Um, that is a major, major, major task. Um, unless you wanna do something like that, this um, has taken us years to do and we're just kind of at the end of getting it to be a first in man. Uh, and then ultimately it goes through lots of preclinical testing. Um, we haven't published any of this because it's still commercial and confidence. We're just about to start to do that. We've done uh, lots of different regulatory testing and developed models to do that. But now we're kind of getting to the close, getting hopefully getting close to a potential commercial exit on that one. So that was a different pathway. The last one I want to share with you, and then hopefully we have some time for a discussion, is one where, again, it was a spinal fusion idea where we licensed early to a commercial partner. Um, and we participated in the product development side uh, and the evaluation and testing and the regulatory approval. Um, and through that, we have um, participated in the launch of five products um, with a company called C-Spine, which I'll shout out a little bit more later. Um, and so far, and uh, what's interesting about this, the patents actually came after the commercialization. So we commercialized it prior to the patents uh, and we commercialized it prior to the patents because we had strong preclinical evidence and strong laboratory evidence that it was a good idea. Uh, and then the company believed in us. We met with our tech transfer office early in the piece. We worked closely with them to help us get a deal over the line. Uh, and so that was successful. And to date, there have been over 10,000 implantations done, um, both in Australia and in the US. And there's five implants that are currently in that product family. And so when we did this, we initially went to the computer and we did some computer modeling of different design of implants and concepts that we had. And we learned a lot about how the spine works and how fusions occur. Um, I won't go into all the nitty gritty science details, but we came up with an idea that was novel and patentable. Um, and then we wanna, went on and we actually did a pilot study where we manufactured implants. Um, we had them made by a, a third party under NDA. We put them into a large animal model that we had in my laboratory at UNSW. And then we evaluated them. And, you know, this is uh, this is a control group. Um, this is not a fusion. This is one of our concepts. This is a fusion. There's bone growing through it. This is a fusion. This is another permutation. We came up with probably 25 different um, embodiments. We only tested two. Um, this is what it looks like at 26 weeks. And 
this figure in the middle is what I used ultimately to convince um, a commercial partner that it was a good idea and then they got behind it and we tested it mechanically. We showed that as the spine fused, the range of motion decreased. This is flexion and extension. This is lateral bending. This is using a robot. Um, and then we went on and we developed this implant with our industrial um, collaborators. It's important. We could never have done this by ourselves because we don't have product development. We don't have you know manufacturing. We to, to do what we did, uh, even in the you know the pilot data was pretty amazing. And so working with them, we evolved our, our concepts and our ideas, and we ended up with this implant. Um, we called it Reef um, Topography, where it had a variety of um, unique features. Um, that both aperture engagement and end plate engagement working together to fuse the spine. Then um, the, my uh, co friends and colleagues, um, Frank Vizeshi was actually one of my PhD students as well, and Schaefer Banigan from the company. We did a preclinical study in large animals to prove out the technology. We published it, they supported it. Um, we did a nice experiment where we isolated the variables. Um, we put it into a large animal inner body fusion study and where we demonstrated the benefits of the features and how they provide um, a, a means to uh, fuse the spine in the inner body space. Um, then the patents followed um, and we were granted one in 2021 and one in 22. We have um, another divisional that Georgina has uh, carved out with us. Um, and this is kind of how it works is that the, um, the implants grow into the uh, or the body grows into the features, it integrates, it fuses early, it changes the stress distribution of the spine, and you get fusion early. Um, and here's just a nice little video that was ultimately made. I'll just show this to you just for a second. It just looks super cool in my mind. I'll lower the, uh, I'll lower the music. Um, so this incorporated technology that C-Spine had that I actually tested for them a decade ago, which is a titanium coating that was bonded to peak. And that's what the surface of the coating looks like under EM. And there's the features. This is a cervical implant. And uh, then it has aperture and uh, end plate engagement features. So the body grows into it and locks it down. It's kind of like climbing a rock wall. You don't have to go all the way through. And there's the lateral a T lift, and that's the ACDF. And They've gone on and um, launched a a lift, a, a, an anterior procedure from the front. Um, this is ACDF. This is from the front for cervical. And this is it at a trade show. Um, and then my friend and colleague in Melbourne with Ian Wang and Greg Mellum did a, just recently did a human clinical study. Uh, and again, it was a randomized um, uh, study comparing um, the reef topography to without the features. And again, this has been submitted for publication. And what we found was faster fusion with the technology and better fusion quality. So we went all the way to the human burden. And here's a CT scan from Greg um, at six months with Shoreline RT. That's what it's called. Um, and so at the end of the day, the research that we do in a university can get out to industry. It can get out to commercializing. Um, and for me, research is a method um, and you really have to discuss, discuss, execute, and be careful what you wish for. You may get it. Um, and then I'd like, again, to thank um, my knowledge exchange colleagues, my tech transfer um, gurus at UNSW, um, and then C-SPINE, um, who are currently uh, utilize, or working with us with that, and also to the patent attorneys um, that have helped us through this, um, through this pathway. Um, that's me in 90, uh, 1997, and that's me last week, so not much has changed maybe a little bit older, but um, and I think this is the first uh, evidence of dual monitors being used scientifically. That's at my old office at Prince of Wales. And uh, there's my friend Khalid Mohammed, and there his picture is still right up there. So I, I think I've remained the same. Hopefully you come to universities for questions, answer, inspiration, and ultimately the truth. Um, and I'd like to thank you for your time. And if there's any questions or if I can be of any assistance, all you have to do is contact me. Oh, thanks so much. That was really great. <clears throat> Space on the desk has improved considerably since we got rid of those cathode ray tubes, right? <laughs> <laughs> I still have some of those monitors. <laughs>
Well, they're being used as paperweights now, are they are uh, keeping the door open. <laughs> door jams, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, to both of you. Those um, talks were fascinating. And obviously, you know, we, we have a limitation on time, but I think you really captured the flavour of what we wanted to talk about today, the importance of working in the institution, working with the tech transfer office. The examples you've given today are all about UNSW. Um, this um, seminar series is obviously applicable to everyone, including most of the other members of the Randwick Health and Innovation Precinct. I think just to make a comment, um, all of the members um, of the Randwick Health and Innovation Precinct will have an IP policy. So, you know, refer to your own IP policy uh, in terms of your ownership conditions. And if you're struggling for advice, feel free to reach out to me and I can, I can either point you in the right direction as to, um, you know, if you're outside of UNSW, then, then come and speak to me about any of these issues. Very happy to do that. Um, uh, Everyone just feel free to put your hand up if you'd like to ask a question. I've got a question from Ian, which I'm going to ask in a moment. Um, but first of all, um, Joy, I just wanted to ask you from some of your experiences, uh, you know, these days digital health is becoming a huge um, uh, uh, invention area, I guess, and cr can create some difficulties around these sort of traditional models of patent protection, etc. What what are you seeing in terms of the way in which digital health is affecting the way tech transfer offices operate, and and, and what sort of mechanisms they're using for protection, etc. Yeah, um, thanks, Stephen. And that's a really really great question because in terms of digital health, like you yeah, um, sort of alluded to. Um, uh, non-patentable um, forms of IP um, tend to be the ones that create value um, in that space. Um, so, for example, um, having access to unique data sets, um, you know, specialized potential, for example, specialized patient cohorts and that kind of thing um, adds value in terms of um, um, an industry wanting to partner with, say, a research organization. Um, in terms of, I guess, IP protection, um, so while patent protection, you, you don't see a lot of, um, and that's mainly because at the moment, um, software patents, um, there's, there's um, um, it's very difficult to prosecute and get it through the line. Um, different, um, different, jurisdictions have different ways in which they treat software patents. So there's not that um, there's not that similar, I guess, level of consistency that you might get in terms of um, traditional um, uh, other kinds of patentable um, IP. Um, but that said, um, software copyrights, as I mentioned before, copyrights um, exist upon creation. So you've already got um, on some form protection um, from the get go. But another thing you can do is um, rather than you know, you, you could um, leverage, you know, I guess confidential information in that, um, you know, don't disclose um, key parts of, of the code for people to copy um, rather. And you might want to um, um, maintain the specific algorithms that you use um, in your platforms or software confidential so you can publish things around it but you know you might want to keep the actual algorithms um to yourself does that answer right. the is, yeah. is that absolutely yeah so i mean i guess that bringing back that trade seeker sort of strategy is um you know the old coca-cola trick is um i guess becoming more important again isn't it yeah, yeah. so i'm going to ask ian's question perhaps to bill first um so ian asks what in your view are the key enablers that allow you to collaborate effectively with clinicians industry and other scientists bill um, I think the key enabler is understanding their language. Um, you know, it became very evident to me early in my career is that, you know, if I want to go fishing, I have to go where the fish are. Um, if I want to talk to surgeons, where do you talk to a surgeon? You talk to a surgeon in the operating theater or in the beginning of the day or the end of the day. Um, you know, you don't, he's not going to come to your office at two o'clock in the afternoon when he's seeing patients. So, I mean, I learned that from my original boss, uh, Mike Ehrlich, who is a professor at Brown University. He said, if you want to talk to us, you know, come at six o'clock in the morning or stay at six o'clock at night. So knowing, uh, knowing the other trigger points of your colleagues, um, understanding their language. I mean, I'm lucky I've had a, a firm, um, I've had a lot of great surgeon support um, at UNSW as well. I mean, um, like Phil Crow, who's the head of our division, 
I've had lots of surgeons who have done PhDs with me. Um, I continue to learn uh, in their fields. Um, I'm not a surgeon, but you know, I've done thousands of, of surgeries myself on the preclinical world. So understanding their language, I think also standing, understanding the clinical need. Um, like where is the where is the clinical need? Um, and if there's not a clinical need, um, then often it's hard to commercialize it. So if there's no clinical need um, and someone will say, but it doesn't come in blue. Well, blue doesn't make it an invention. Um, you know, it can be cost more cost effective. It could be easier for the surgeon or the um, clinician to use at the point of care. Um, it could potentially be cheaper to manufacture. So there's a lot of things to understand, but knowing the problem um, without a problem, then really what is the solution? Um, and solutions, some people, you know, come up with an idea and then look for a problem. Um, I like to identify a problem first and then say, well, how can I come up with an idea? Um, and actually learning to how to do, to create an idea. I mean, I have two or three other ideas sitting on my desk, like right now. I prototype them. I know it's a problem because my clinic, my surgeon friends say, this is a real pain in the bum, Bill. When we're in theater, this is a problem. Or when this comes back and the x-ray looks like this, so I think understanding those, but to also speaking to other people that have um, been there before. Um, I mean, as I said before, I've, I'm surrounded constantly by people that are trying to develop new ideas or, you know, and they're, they're either coming to me and say, Bill, how do we test it? You know, how do we differentiate it? How can we show that it has a benefit? So I've been very lucky. I've been, my mind is constantly seated with um, interesting conversations. Um, but ultimately, it all comes down to communication. Um, at least that's how I see it. But the, the IP side and the patent side is a completely different language. Um, and when you read a patent, you go, what the hell is this stuff? What does it mean? You know, so it's it's complete. And, you know, medicine, surgery, um, engineering, patent, they're all separate languages. Um, but everyone is speaking football, according to you know, the World Cup, everyone, I love that commercial, everyone speaks football, which is true. And, and patenting, just for everybody's benefit, will be a topic um, that we will cover in this seminar series later. So, um, and, and we'll delve into that. In and you know, Steve, reason. I just have to say, I always, if someone says to me, I have a patent, I said, well, how much have you spent so far? And they said, I've spent five grand. I said, you have nothing. <laughs> you have nothing. When you spend a quarter of a million, that's when you have a patent. <laughs> Yeah, very true, Bill. Yeah, it's a long way to go, isn't it, before you actually get the thing granted, for sure. Um, just the last few minutes left. Um, so, Joy, I was just going to ask you, you know, you started out life PhD with, with Bill. Um, what made you to turn to the commercialization and training as a tech transfer professional? That's a fantastic question, Steve. Um, so as a PhD student in Bill's lab, um, fortunately, um, this scheme called the commercialization training scheme um, came about where the incentive was for PhD students who had uh, a relevant project, they, they would be eligible to have a scholarship top up if they were to study um, commercialization um, under the graduate certificate. Um, so that was an additional um, six months um, um, of, of um, um, and you get the qualification at the end. Um, and so, well, initially the driver was to get that top up scholarship. What I found was actually while I was undertaking that training, it actually helped me understand and place the context of what I was researching into sort of the broader real world, um, um, where it fits in the real world. And um, it also, like what Bill was saying, it kind of brought to mind a lot of un unknowns that I'd never even thought about in terms of trying to get something from the lab to benefit, you know, patients. Um, and so after that, um, you know, I was kind of hooked and felt like, you know, this is something that I need to share with with other people. Um, so that's what really sort of sparked my interest in terms of getting into tech transfer. And then eventually I, I got roles at um, MIT, NIH, NCI, um, University of Melbourne and here. And like I've been doing it for 10 years, but I'm one of the best things is that I'm always learning something new um, and, and that's really the thrill of the job for me. So sort of sitting at that intersection between like science, um, business and law, you're never bored, you're always learning something new, you're always working with great people and it's just that, you know, that opportunity to be able to do something meaningful, create impact and you know, potentially 
change the world or someone's life. Fantastic, Joy. Thanks for that. That's a really great way to end. And, and Bill, just to give you the final words before we close, you do research um, which leads to publications and you also make inventions. Which would you rather be doing? Um, I'd like to do both. I like doing both. You know what? I, I still like um, having IOP and honor students and undergraduate students. I've had many, many, many PhD students, but you know, a lot of my um, my my students, um, I mean, Joy success story. I've, I could tell you 10 success stories. I mean, Nikki, one of my other guys, he did that commercialization thing and he just raised uh, a couple million dollars for one of his ideas in Ireland. Um, so, you know, and I still have a couple that I like to do, but um, if anyone on the uh, on the meeting today wants to reach out or have a chit chat, I'm happy to help. Um, and I, I think ultimately, you know, universities are a great place to, uh, you know, to find out more. That's that's why we're here. That's why I think we're here. I'm, I think we're here. We're not. I'm not. I mean, we work with people from all over, um, not just people from UNSW. But Steve, thank, thank you. Too. Thank you for inviting me to do this. Um, and I look forward to my knowledge exchange coffee cup to add to my collection. Um, I don't know if that's part of the uh, or the Ramwork Health Precinct Innovation coffee cup or T-shirts. It's, it's in the post, Bill. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, 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 it'll be on its way. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again, right, both of you. Really great no talks. Worries. Thank you. And uh, we'll close it there. But um, yeah, thanks everyone for attending. And um, yeah, see you next time. Thanks. Thanks, Bye. guys. Thank you. Cheers.